Number 10. Wolverine Loses His Skeleton During 1993's Fatal Attraction's crossover event, the X-Men once again had to go up against their old rival, Magneto. The X-Men got the upper hand in this conflict by using the combined psychic powers of Jean Grey and Professor X to cause Magneto to relive all of his worst memories in order to distract him. Which is already pretty brutal when you consider that Magneto was a prisoner in German death camps in World War II. Wolverine attacks Magneto and gets a good scratch in, which leads the Master of Magnetism to do one of the most disturbing things imaginable to the fuzzy Canadian. He pulls out Wolverine's metal skeleton, leaving him a twisted heap of adamantium as the X-Men can only look on in horror. It's a brutal moment, but it doesn't really fit the never saw it coming side of this. I mean, he's a guy with metal bones fighting a guy named Magneto. If anything, I'm surprised this doesn't happen more often. Number 9. Sentry vs. Ares When Norman Osborn set his sights on conquering Asgard, he tricked the god of war Ares into helping him do it. As the battle raged on, Ares discovered that he had been tricked and turned on Osborn, vowing to destroy him. Unfortunately, Norman had the Sentry with him. Worst still, this version of Sentry had given in to the darker urges of his void self. Ares did his best against Sentry, but the fight ended in a truly brutal fashion, with Sentry ripping Ares in half in a shower of gore and entrails. It's a uh... It's a lot, but although you could make the case for it being one of the most graphic Marvel moments, I don't think it checks enough emotional boxes for me to consider it the most brutal by any means. Number 8. Punisher's Steamroller Frank Castle isn't known for working well with others, but if there's anyone you'd think he'd get along with, it would be Wolverine. They teamed up in Punisher Volume 6, Number 17, and it quickly went off the rails with them being swarmed by a gang of little people people who wanted to cut off their legs in order to make them short. In order to get Wolverine into a fit of berserker rage, Frank makes fun of Logan's height, causing Wolverine to go after him. Wolverine calmed down, but Punisher decided that he was slowing him down and blasted Wolvie's legs apart. After taking care of the gang of little people, Frank decides that the best way to keep Wolverine from coming after him is to run him over with a steamroller. Wolverine will obviously heal, so it doesn't have long-term consequences, but it's still a pretty rough move on Frank's part. Number 7. Alpha Flight vs. Michael Pointer During the events of M-Day, a mutant named Michael Pointer was taken over by an evil being called the Collective, who used him to destroy an Alaskan town. S.H.I.E.L.D. sent in a couple fighter jets to keep an eye on the situation, but they were promptly destroyed and the Collective made his way into Canada. Now, keep in mind, this is a list of brutal moments for me. So imagine my excitement reading an Avengers issue where my favorite superhero team, Alpha Flight, shows up to try and reason with the villain. Now imagine my horror when the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent's command center suddenly loses contact and the next thing I saw was the entire team's twisted and mangled corpses. These guys had their own 130 issue series for years, so it's not like they're just nobodies, and now they were suddenly just dead. Now I get that not many people like the team as much as I do. So for perspective, imagine if your favorite team was the Fantastic Four and they were horribly mutilated off panel. Oh, poor Guardian. That's like the fifth time he's died. I think that what makes this such a brutal moment for me, beyond my personal attachment to the characters, is that it is so quick and off panel, leaving us to imagine what horrible things were done to leave such a terrified looking gory mess of Canada's super team. Number 6. Rick Jones's Fate Worse Than Death Immortal Hulk is a cosmic horror series with plenty of brutal moments with characters constantly getting eviscerated and transformed into creatures that are pure nightmare fuel. You could make the case for Banner, Absorbing Man, or any of the Hulks earning this spot, but no one quite got as brutal a fate as Hulk's old friend Rick Jones. When the Shadow Base wanted to go after the Hulk, they combined the deceased Rick's body with that of the Abomination, causing Rick to 
transform into a bizarre and terrifying creature with two of Rick's faces and hands growing out of his head, which would vomit acid at the Hulk while Rick begged for help. He was eventually removed from this abomination, but a few issues later, he was once again fused with a gamma mutate, this time Del Fry, leaving Rick a twisted, co-joined mess with Rick's screaming head being the arm of a glowing green skeleton creature. Number 5. Carnage USA One of Spider-Man's most brutal and sadistic villains is Carnage. He is a serial murderer named Cletus Cassidy, who bonded with a symbiote and became an even more dangerous and twisted villain. He has had a lot of brutal moments over the years, such as his actions in Maximum Carnage and Deadpool vs Carnage, but my preference is for the miniseries Carnage USA. In this story, Carnage goes to a small town and sneaks into a meatpacking plant in order to eat an entire herd of cattle so that he can get strong enough to take over the town. He sends the symbiote in through the water pipes and takes over men, women, and children, forcing them to attack each other and holding a few of them hostage for and amusement. There are some brutal Cletus moments, such as sending a woman out to collect her husband's head in order to secure the safety of her children, but my favorite and most twisted is when he gathers all of the survivors in a church, hands out a bunch of pliers, and demands they pull out their own teeth in exchange for his mercy. Number 4. Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe Again In Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, Deadpool became aware of his status as a fictional character and lost his mind, going on a brutal kill streak that resulted in all the Marvel heroes and villains getting dispatched in cruel and unusual ways. A few years later in the sequel, we got to see a Deadpool from another world do the same thing. On this earth, Deadpool is put under mind control by the villains of the Marvel Universe and tricked into going after his friends. What makes it even more disturbing than the first for me was the fact that while he's attacking the heroes, he is living a fantasy in his head that makes him think that he is going on lighthearted adventures with his friends. This is especially true of his encounter with Spider-Man while bonded with the Venom symbiote. In his mind, Deadpool and Spidey are entered into a pie-eating contest against the Blob in order to win money for charity. In reality, he's actually feasting on Spider-Man's brains. It's more brutal due to the lack of agency he's given in his story and the devastating consequences that it holds. Number 3. The Ultimatum Wave The Marvel Ultimate Universe was a wild ride. It gave us Miles Morales, as well as the romance between Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, so it makes sense that they would also give us some of the most bizarre and extreme Marvel stories. In Ultimatum, Magneto has been driven mad at the loss of his children and decides that rather than destroying humanity to make the world safe for mutants, he's just gonna kill everyone. He uses a doomsday device and his powers to shift the world off of its axis causing natural disasters all over the globe. Much of Europe, including all of Latveria, is frozen under a layer of ice, and New York is hit by a massive tidal wave. Millions of people all over the world die in the attack, including Nightcrawler and Hank McCoy. Magneto then sends out more of his minions to destroy the heroes, causing the brutal deaths of several more heroes, including Hank Pym, Doctor Strange, and Thor, just to name a few. Professor X gets personally murdered by Magneto, who later has his face blasted off by Cyclops, who then gets assassinated at an anti-mutant rally. It is a relentless story, but I think the most brutal moment is when Pym finds his wife Janet being eaten by the Blob and responds by entering his giant form, picking up the Blob, and biting his head off. Number 2. Marvel Zombies Marvel Zombies is pretty self-explanatory. It takes place on an alternate Earth where the heroes of the Marvel Universe have been infected with a zombie virus. They retain much of their intelligence and personality, but they are so consumed with hunger that they are willing to go to any lengths to get to their next meal. There is something so brutal about watching all of your favorite heroes hunt down Magneto and brutally and graphically eat him in the open opening pages, and it only gets more disturbing 
everything from there. I'd say that the most brutal moment in this story is the revelation that Hank Pym has been keeping T'Challa sedated but alive in a lab and he has been removing his limbs one by one to eat. It's a brutal and disgusting story that you can't help but have fun reading. Number 1. Spider-Man's Take on September 11th There are way more gory and graphic Marvel moments on this list, but the fact that this comic features the real life tragedy of September 11th, 2001 makes it hard to justify putting it lower on the list. Like, I can't sit here and say that a fictional tidal wave was worse than this. Anyways, this issue of Amazing Spider-Man was released a month after the tragedy and opens with Spider-Man surveying the devastation as civilians ask him why he didn't stop the attack. The book is kind of a mixed bag with the benefit of hindsight with devastating moments like a little boy lost in the rubble looking for his dad, but also features moments like Doctor Doom crying at the sight of the devastation as if he hasn't tried to do this exact same thing multiple times. I have mixed feelings about whether this book should have been made so soon after the real life events, but wherever you land, it's hard not to describe the events depicted as pretty brutal. Number 10. Punisher Ends the Human Race In the one-shot comic, Punisher The End, we are introduced to a prison that is executing all of its prisoners in preparation for an upcoming nuclear war, with the guards planning on then hiding out in a bomb shelter that is installed. One of the prisoners is actually Frank Castle, who has grown older and has been caught and locked up. He gets in the shelter before the last comes and after a year, he and a companion from the prison exit and start making their way through the wasteland. Frank knows that the radiation levels he is exposing himself to will cause him to die within 72 hours, but keeps moving forwards, eventually getting to his goal. A shelter filled with former billionaires who knew their decisions would lead to an apocalypse and hid themselves away. He prepares to punish them, but the sleazy rich people convince him to spare them long enough to explain the seriousness of the situation to him. Him. The other shelters have fallen silent, and they have the means to continue the species, and if Frank ends them, he will also be ending the human race. Frank then mercilessly and brutally murders everyone, including his companion, before walking into the wastelands to die, happy with his decision, believing nothing good ever came from humanity. It is an interesting book, but it leans so far into the mature rating that characters tend to overindulge in an unnecessary amount of slurs and swears, to the point that it actually somehow makes the whole thing feel more childish than many standard Marvel comics. Number 9. Deadpool Killustrated The sequel to the first Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe features Deadpool trying to destroy the Marvel Universe by going into other fictional stories that inspired the Marvel heroes in order to prevent any of them from being created. Over the course of the miniseries, we see Deadpool brutally dispatch such classic characters as Don Quixote, the Little Mermaid, Tom Sawyer, the siblings from Little Women, Moby Dick, and the Three Musketeers while he's pursued through the ideas verse by a team of heroes led by Sherlock Holmes. If you're a fan of these classic characters, it can be really brutal to suddenly see them eviscerated as they scream and cry, asking why this is happening. But the sheer stupidity of it obviously makes it pretty funny. The humor cuts some of the brutality, making this rank pretty low on the list. Number Eight, Scramble Gets Free This next entry is dedicated to one of our commenters, Kevin Hawkins, who has asked that I keep teaching him about Canada's super team, Alpha Flight, so that he can continue to learn about more obscure superheroes in order to help him expand his rather narrow tastes. Sure thing, Kevin. I'll keep the Alpha info coming. The original Alpha Flight series had its fair share of brutal moments, but one that has always stuck in my mind is from issue 30, when Heather accidentally releases Madison Jeff Jeffrey's evil brother, Lionel, otherwise known as Scramble. Scramble has the mutant power to rearrange organic matter. He originally used this power as an army medic in the Vietnam War, but the trauma of the war drove him insane and he was locked away in a hospital. Once he got free, he used his powers to turn the other patients into deformed and grotesque mounds of mutated flesh that then attacked the heroes. Every design in this issue is wonderfully brutal and disgusting including the creature that Heather is transformed into. The victims are eventually saved and put back in their original shapes, which makes this a bit less brutal
brutal, but it was an especially disturbing issue. Number 7. Thanos Rising Thanos Rising is a mini-series that explores the origins of one of Marvel's most iconic villains, Thanos the Mad Titan. It starts with him as a child, and explores his early courtship with Death, who keeps manipulating him into situations that cause Thanos to kill. At first he is taking out lizards that hurt his friends, but this soon escalates into him capturing classmates in order to dissect them to see what is wrong with him in comparison to others. He insists that all the death is just a means to an end, but eventually admits that he has grown to enjoy it. This solidifies when he decides to capture and dissect his mother so that he can continue to find out why he is different, showing no remorse or care for his actions. It is a brutal origin for the character, and honestly, for a character as twisted as Thanos, nothing else would have sufficed. Number 6. Deadpool Kills His Parents Part of the original Sin comics, Deadpool Volume 5 Issue 34 features a twisted tale from the Merc with the Mouths past. It takes place in the 90s and is drawn in a style that reflects that. In this story, we see Deadpool in his early days as a brainwashed assassin. His handler decides to test how deeply they have Wade under their control and sends him and Sabretooth to his childhood home with the mission of ending the lives of his own parents. Wade Wade doesn't have much memory of his past and eagerly goes for the house, but he is stopped from attacking his parents. Kevin, you are never gonna guess who stops him. It's 90s Alpha Flight, who I'm honestly surprised haven't crossed paths with Deadpool more often. The two teams fight, and Sabretooth and Deadpool manage to get away, their mission a failure. The jovial tone of the book then takes a sharp turn as Deadpool grabs a drink, returns to his childhood home, and silently takes a tour of the strange and familiar sights before setting the house on fire and getting into the car with Sabretooth without a word. The fact that the book is so lighthearted before this this moment makes the final blow so much more brutal. Number 5. Hulk The End While I found Punisher The End to be kinda bad and immature despite trying really hard to be mature, I really like the Hulk The End story. In this book, the world has come to an end after a nuclear war, and all of humanity has died off save Bruce Banner, who is now over 200 years old. He wanders the world by himself, wanting to die but being unable to as the Hulk wants to continue being the strongest one there is. The only creatures that have survived are giant mutated swarms of bugs who chase and devour the Hulk, always leaving him a mutilated mess on the ground before leaving him to heal. This continues for years until Bruce realizes that he is the modern Prometheus, who brought fire to the people of Earth from the gods and was punished by being left alone to be consumed by birds. Bruce finally passes, leaving the Hulk to wander the wasteland completely alone for all time. Number 4. Marvel Zombies – Dead Days In Marvel Zombies, we are shown a world where all of the Earth's heroes have been transformed into flesh-eating zombies who are trying to find more humans to consume to sate their seemingly unending appetite. In the one-shot comic Dead Days, we are shown the last days of the human race, as well as our favorite heroes becoming the cruel monsters we know from Marvel Zombies. There are some brutal and disturbing moments, such as Spider-Man turning and eating Mary Jane. Okay, Kevin will appreciate this. We get to see the zombified Alpha Flight attacking the X-Men after having ate Professor X before they are graphically dispatched by Magneto. We also get to see She-Hulk eating Val and Franklin Richards before having her head blown off by Sue Storm. Every page is more disturbing than the last, but I think the worst part is when Reed Richards decides that zombies are actually the next step in evolution and infects the other Fantastic Four members and then allows them to feed on him and turn him as he smiles. Number 3. Civil War For anyone only familiar with the movie adaptation of Marvel's Civil War, the reasons behind the Superhero Registration Act are a bit different, and much more awful. The story begins with the superhero team The New Warriors about to raid a home in Stamford, Connecticut, where a group of supervillains are hiding out. The New Warriors were filming a reality show and were being extremely careless when they attacked the villains. The resulting fight led to the villain Nitro and Namorita fighting in front of a school full of children. Nitro then exploded, 
wiping out the school and the surrounding area. Hundreds of civilians, most of the villains, and most of the heroes all died as a result. It is a rough way to start off the book, and really does a good job of setting up the moral quandary at the heart of the story. Number two, Ruins. You guys were super helpful with recommendations in the comments in part one, and a lot of the entries on this list are from there, so thank you. One of the ones I wasn't familiar with that a lot of you mentioned was Marvel Ruins, and you were right. It's a rough one. Marvel Ruins is a two-part miniseries that essentially asks the question of what would the Marvel Universe be if instead of accidents resulting in heroes getting powers, they just got sick and died. For example, in this universe, Matt Murdock saved the old man from getting hit from the truck, and the radioactive goop that got in his eyes caused him to die in the hospital without growing up and becoming Daredevil. Wolverine has a painful bone disease. Captain America introduced Nick Fury to cannibalism at some point. Jean Grey is a teenager selling herself on the street before being killed by Fury, who then takes his own life. Okay, Kevin is gonna be so thrilled. We even get a brief look at Alpha Flight's Aurora and North Star, who are homeless, naked, and starving on the streets. Everything is awful. But my favorite bit comes from issue two, where it is revealed that when Peter Parker was bitten by the radioactive spider, it gave him a deadly and contagious radiation disease that is spreading among the population. The book is relentless. There's not really much of a story thread other than what if everything sucked? And it answers that question in great and brutal detail. Number one, the death of the X-Men. The old man Logan story takes place on an Earth where the villains finally got organized and teamed up to take over the world under the command of the Red Skull. The book is filled with disturbing ideas and moments, such as Hulk having an evil gang of Hulk children with his cousin She-Hulk. But the worst, in my opinion, is how the villains took out the X-Men on the night they came to power. Wolverine was monitoring the situation with Jubilee when the X-Mansion was suddenly attacked by supervillains. As the children fled, Wolverine made a brave, final stand against the bad guys, cutting them down one at a time until there were none left. It was then that Mysterio revealed that the whole thing had been an illusion, and Logan had been attacking his own teammates the entire time. I don't think it gets worse than that. Although, I can picture it happening to Adam here at Top 10 Nerd. Number 10, Eternals vs. X-Men. So, the Eternals are basically a celestial created experiment and an offshoot of humanity. They have an eternal struggle against another offshoot, the Deviants. Eternals have hardwired programming to protect the Celestials and to correct excess deviation. Now, a recent revelation about mutants and deviants causes the new Eternal leader, a pretty sinister guy by the name of Druig, to decide that the mutants represent excess deviation. Thanks to that, war is declared on all mutants everywhere. Following their programming, Eternal Assassins come to Krakoa to destroy the Five. Massive War Machine Eternals called the Hex are unleashed on Krakoa, and Uranos, one of the oldest and nastiest of all the Eternals, is unleashed on Arako. Now, Uranos is only able to be released from his prison for one hour at a time, but within that hour, Uranos is able to take out every member of the Great Ring of Arako, all of which are Omega-level mutants. Hell, in the first 20 minutes, Uranos arrests eradicated Cable, Magneto, and David Haller, otherwise known as Legion. He then goes on to wipe out about a million mutants. Number 9, Magneto vs. Red Skull. Now some of you may know this, but I think this is one of my absolute favorite Magneto moments. And he has a lot of good ones, so that's saying something. Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II, and we all know Red Skull and Hydra's stance in World War II Germany. So it's safe to say that these two villains don't really like each other, right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually temporarily united. But it's really important to note here that Magneto was unsure whether this was the Red Skull that aided Germany. So Magneto confronted him, and Red Skull did indeed confirm that he was the original. Now it didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the Red Skull, but unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, 
dead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape hatch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food, no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. Number 8 Hulk vs Abomination Compared to their counterparts in the MCU, Abomination and the Hulk in the comics are basically like gods. Comic book Abomination is completely psychotic, and the Hulk is basically a god of rage and strength. So when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross in the comics using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easily. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I have ever seen. Emil Blonsky comes walking out of the water and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the barbie. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels underwater and through a dam, flooding an entire town. All the while, these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. Then Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which just makes him angrier, increasing his strength and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist, causing minor earthquakes and leaving a meal on the edge of life with his brain exposed. Other than being just an amazing fight, this comic also really shows the relationship between these two on a level not really captured anywhere else. Number 7 Manucci If you want to talk brutal moments in Marvel Comics, you really need to look no further than the Punisher. Now, Manucci is the head of the Nucci crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank Castle had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and her legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian. In The Punisher Volume 5, number 12, after taking down about 80, yes, 80 of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was really willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She puts up a decent fight with no limbs though, which is kind of impressive. After she attempted to gnaw off his ankles, unsurprisingly unsuccessfully, Frank uses his big old boot plus the muscles in his leg and not so gently flings this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Number 6 Punisher Netflix Prison Fight The Punisher isn't just absolutely ruthless in the comics. When Punisher made his way onto the small screen in Netflix's Daredevil series, he gave us probably one of the most down right savage and ferocious cinematic Marvel moments Ever. Taking place in Daredevil Season 2, Episode 9, Frank, played by the irreplaceable John Bernthal, found himself in prison alongside the scum that he absolutely despises, and thanks to the Kingpin's influence, he gets locked in a hallway with about 10 inmates, his bare fists, and some very, very rudimentary prison tools. What follows is a solid two and a half minutes of absolute savagery and brutality as he swiftly ushers each of these inmates to the afterlife, leaving him bruised and battered and covered in the red vino on tap, and ready to face off against a group of officers in riot gear who come in afterwards. Knowing how the main Marvel Cinematic Universe shies away from anything not suitable for a 12 year old, this scene, and honestly all of the Netflix Marvel shows, stand out as something truly different and exactly what us older fans expected to see from someone as ruthless as The Punisher. Number 5 Punisher vs Wolverine Yes, The Punisher is taking up 3 points on this list and I think it's pretty justified. In the early 2000s, Punisher faced off with Wolverine in Punisher number 16 and 17. Essentially, the Punisher found himself in the crosshairs of Logan and he needed to buy himself some time without Wolverine getting in his way. To do this, Punisher blows off Wolverine's face with a bit of buckshot in Punisher number 16. Now, thanks to his insane healing factor, Logan is still standing with his face already starting to heal over his exposed adamantium skull. So obviously, that didn't really buy the Punisher much time. So instead, in Punisher number 17, Frank Castle makes things just a little bit more below the belt, literally, as he wiped Wolverine's gonads off of the playing field in a similar way to how he took off his face. But of course, even this won't stop the mutants, so Frank Castle resorts to even more drastic and kind of creative measures. Needing the means to give himself at least a day or two before Logan will start coming after him again, the Punisher uses a steamroller to slowly, but completely, flatten Logan, and then he parks it there and walks off to do his business. If anything, I, I think this is a testament to how powerful Wolverine actually is. Number 4 Alejandra Jones Alright buckle up because this one involves Adam. 
Not me, like the biblical Adam. In Marvel Comics, Adam has devoted himself to one day eradicating sin from mankind at any cost, even human souls. To that end, Adam took in orphaned children and trained them within a Nicaraguan temple to make them perfect hosts for the Ghost Rider. Now, with the Fear Itself event and the arrival of the Serpent, Adam decided that this was a sign to make his move and offered to free Johnny Blaze from the Ghost Rider. Adam awakened the Seeker and had him pick the new Ghost Rider among his students. Alejandro Jones was the one chosen and was immediately sent to battle Scotty, one of the Serpent's avatars. When she came back, Adam demanded that she destroy the sin in the other orphans, leaving them as complete husks. Now she obviously refused to do that, but in return, Adam made her an unwilling servant. Johnny Blaze, realizing that he made a boo boo, journeyed to Nicaragua to stop them, but Adam turned Alejandra's power into a massive explosion that encompassed most of the entire country, turning the citizens, all of them, into mindless emotional shells of the individuals that they once were. The only ones unaffected by the blast were Johnny himself and the Seeker. Alejandro was used to destroy the whole of Nicaragua. Number 3 M Day So we know that in the House of M story, Scarlet Witch altered reality in some rather big ways. But it wasn't as if everything before this didn't happen. Just no one could remember it. One mutant by the name of Layla Miller, for example, could remember the reality before, and she used her powers to restore the memories of a bunch of other heroes. Another mutant who you might know of by the name of Wolverine could sense that something was wrong with this reality. Now he and a few other heroes, including a resurrected Hawkeye, formed up into a team and put things back to normal. Now seeing as Magneto was now the ruler, it made sense to them that he was the one responsible and they went on to attack him. During the scuffle, Magneto had his memories returned to him by Layla and Wanda convinced him it was Quicksilver who urged her to do the whole reality warping thing in the first place. Angrily confronting Quicksilver, who admitted that he would have let Wanda perish, Magneto made him perish. Wanda, who was thoroughly angry and pretty unstable, yet again, again, revived her brother, yelled at her not father, denounced Xavier, and in three words, no more mutants, she reverted reality. She depowered 90% of the entire mutant population, resulting in a huge loss of life. All this on the day forever known as M Day. Number two, Ultimatum. Ultimatum was supposed to be how the writers finished off the Ultimate Universe stories. Obviously, it didn't really work out that way. Writers kind of just went a little haywire with the things they would do with a dying universe story. Basically, Magneto, who had been a pretty brutal villain in the Ultimate Universe so far, goes even farther during the mega event. Basically, after Magneto gains control of the Hammer of Thor and is manipulated by none other than Doctor Doom, he messes with the magnetic pillars of the world, flipping them on their head and sending weather into a frenzy. The biggest event was a giant tsunami called the Ultimatum Wave that basically put New York underwater. And brought a giant casualty list. Bruce Banner perishes, but the Hulk ends up living somehow, multiple X-Men pass away, the Wasp gets eaten by the Blob, who in turn gets his head bitten off by Hank Pym, Dormammu turns Doctor Strange into a squished ketchup bottle, and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are sent to the afterlife. In a bit more of a divisive move, while the X-Men are looking for their fallen teammates in the wake of the tidal wave in New York, Magneto pays a visit to Professor X and in a pretty brutal scene, snaps the Professor's neck. In retaliation, the X-Men attack Magneto's fortress. Angel gets stomped and chomped by Sabretooth, and Magneto eventually rips the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton and pretty much disintegrates him. And that's just the big stuff. And finally, in at number one, it's the fall of X. During this year's annual mutant celebration, the Hellfire Gala, literally on the very next page after the new X-Men team is finally announced, out of nowhere, the anti-mutant organization known as Orcus attacks the gala, with Nimrod coming crashing down from the thermosphere at terminal velocity. He completely obliterates Dazzler, Frenzy, Cannibal, and Prodigy, and then punches Jubilee into the ground, wiping out five of the eight new X-Men before he managed to decimate Bobby Drake Iceman, another Omega level mutant. While Juggernaut held off Nimrod, Jean Grey was taken out by Moira X, and Dr. Stasis revealed to Professor X that the medicine that the X-Men had been producing for the world that 
that has led to Krakoa becoming a world power have all been tampered with. And Stasis can now control or wipe out any human who used any of the medicine produced by the X-Men. In exchange for him agreeing to not do that, Charles Xavier agrees to use his power to force the mutant population of Krakoa, some 200,000 strong mutants, to go through teleportation gates to the X-Men's home on Arako slash Mars. Now Orcus planned on having Arako being its next target, but instead, something went horribly wrong and 200,000 mutants were suddenly transported to the White Hot Room, essentially the afterlife and the base of operations of the Phoenix Force. Number 10, Spider-Man Reign. Spider-Man is arguably the face of Marvel, and for some good reasons too. He's incredibly inspiring, full of hope, and is never one to give up. For all those reasons, when Spider-Man Reign was released in 2007, it was incredibly hard to see an old, tired, and torn down Peter Parker who had pretty much given up. Set 30 years after the modern Spider-Man stories with a retired old man version of Peter Parker, Spider-Man Reign's venom has dawned the identity of Edward Sachs, the aide to the current New York mayor, and has been quietly pulling the strings from within. He's recreated himself multiple times, became the new leader of the Sinister Six, and has installed a security system around New York to stop anyone from leaving. He has goons that walk the streets, he's a total criminal mastermind. But of all the dark and depressing things in this story, there is one thing that stands above the rest. Through the course of the story, we learn that Mary Jane, Peter Parker's greatest love, has passed away and he's been hanging on to this memory of her and that's likely due to the fact that he is directly responsible. Mary Jane didn't pass away because of a villain or Peter failing to save her. Instead, because of the radioactive spider that gave him his abilities, Peter himself was radioactive active. Through the years and years that Peter Parker and Mary Jane had been together and doing what you do when you're together, Peter's radioactive body had essentially given Mary Jane cancer. We learn this as Peter is hugging her decaying body and bawling his eyes out. It's utterly gut-wrenching. Number 9. Marvel Ruins Marvel Ruins is a story taking place in an alternate comic book universe where literally everything that could possibly go wrong does go wrong. Similar to Ultimatum for part one, it's best to just list some of the events off then get specific here. The Fantastic Four's spacecraft crashes into the Earth and Ben Grimm is left with survivor's guilt. The Incredible Hulk is not so incredible as the gamma radiation he experienced leaves him as a hulking mass of tumors and deformity. Thanks to the radioactive spider, Spider-Man did not gain the abilities of a spider. He instead developed an incredibly brutal mutant virus that left him with a terrible skin rash. And and had him captured and quarantined by the government. The Scarlet Witch betrayed the Avengers to the government, leading to the Quinjet being blown up with all of them inside, and they all go to the grave. Nick Fury was introduced to the idea of um, eating other people by Captain America. Silver Surfer suffocates in space. Johnny Blaze just sets himself on fire as a stunt and goes out in the same stunt. And Magneto's powers go out of control in an airport, destroying everything. The whole story just leaves you wondering what you're supposed to do with your life right now, and I honestly don't know. I can't help you. Number 8. World War Hulk Near the end of the Planet Hulk storyline, the shuttle the Hulk was sent to Sakaar in by the Illuminati at the beginning of the Planet Hulk storyline blows up, wiping out the Green Scar's family. Hulk reaches a whole new level of anger, which is directed at those who sent him here, the Illuminati. And so, he headed to Earth with his war sworn. He made a quick stop at the moon to defeat Black Bolt of the Inhumans, and when he got to Earth, he headed to New York City, giving the city a time limit to be evacuated, and when that time limit stopped, well, he defeated everyone who was left. Iron Man and the Hulkbuster, the Avengers plus their tower, the US Army, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, Juggernaut, Doctor Strange using the power of Zom, who is one of the most powerful magical monsters in Marvel Comics, and the Ghost Rider, all while saving innocent bystanders at the same time. He then threw the Illuminati members he captured into the ring against each other, sparing them as he only sought justice. He was eventually sort of defeated by the Sentry, who he fought until they both reverted back to their human forms, which is when Bruce Banner knocked Bob Reynolds out. Number 7, Secret Empire. In Marvel Comics, there is a character known as Cubic, who is essentially a living cosmic cube in the form of a child. With the incredible powers of a cosmic cube, she can pretty much make anything happen. But when she was manipulated by the villainous organization known as Hydra, she created a Captain America who grew up being loyal to Hydra. Now this Hydra cap would eventually supplant the real Captain America of 616 and would organize the second superhuman civil war, as well as Chitauri invasions of the 
save Earth. He got promoted to director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and influenced the legislation of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, which gave S.H.I.E.L.D. way more authority. He used this new power to basically organize a Hydra takeover of America. Steve Rogers revealed himself as not only a Hydra defector, but the Hydra Supreme. He allied himself with the new Madame Hydra, took advantage of a global catastrophe to seize control of the world's governments, and helped Hydra make its move. Hydra, who had seriously infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., began assuming control of key locations and taking out anyone who stood in its way, including Cap personally taking out Rick Jones, which is a shot that left fans and characters are like reeling and shocked. The reveal of Captain America as a longtime Hydra agent completely took readers by surprise and even a bit of anger. His vast history of being the one to do the right thing suddenly meant very little. Number six, time runs out slash the incursions. So during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run, these things called incursions started to happen, orchestrated by the Beyonders. Essentially, two multiverses would crash together, destroying them both. And the focal point for that crash was obviously the Earth. When the incursions started to threaten the multiverse, Namor the Submariner had a different view from the rest of the Illuminati. And during the incursions with Earth 4290001, Namor destroyed that Earth to save both universes and save his Earth. When the next incursion presented itself right after that, the Illuminati were going to just let it happen instead of destroying an entire alternate Earth. Standing against that though, Namor teamed up with Maximus the Mad of the Inhumans and then together they freed the prisoners of the Illuminati, which included Proxima Midnight, Corvus Glaive, Terax, the Herald of Galactus from Earth 13054, Black Swan, and the Mad Titan, Thanos himself. Basically, this is like the Black Order plus some insanely powerful additions, and they are very, very powerful. This group of villainous powerhouses were sanctioned by the United Nations to destroy the alternate Earths that appeared during incursions. Now, while Namor had planned to use an explosion to destroy the other Earth, Thanos, who pretty much took control of the group, led them in what was basically a complete and utter slaughter. And ultimately, that was for nothing because the incursions happened anyways, pretty much ending this version of the multiverse and bringing us the newest Secret Wars. Number five, Sentry ripping Ares in half. The Sentry is a character that deserves some more spotlight. The problem is he's kind of the most powerful superhero Marvel has. Obviously, that's debatable, but this guy has the power to destroy pretty much anybody in the Marvel Universe. He's reassembled his own molecules and taken out the Molecule Man, for example. He's almost too powerful to include in a lot of stories, but it's the fight between the Sentry and Ares, the literal god of war, in issue two of Marvel's Siege event that really left me sitting there going, did that actually happen? And it did. Ares in this story started on the Dark Avengers before redeeming himself and joining the good guys. He had been showing how awesome he is and he turns his sights on Norman Osborn, which unfortunately means Ares now has to face his friend, the Sentry. Now Sentry punches Ares halfway across Asgard and maybe two or three punches later, he grabs both ends of the God of War and rips him completely in half. Not only did it leave everyone on the page frozen, it also left readers completely stunned. Number four, the last Avengers story. In 1995, Marvel released The Last Avengers Story, and with a title like that, being from 1995, you can imagine it's not all sunshine and rainbows, and it's not. Within the first few pages, the current Avengers of this alternate future and their base are completely wiped out by an absolutely massive explosion caused by Ultron 59. Now, Ultron 59 basically then challenges the original Avengers to a final fight against himself and a team of very powerful villains. Now, side note, the art in this comic is actually pretty cool, which unfortunately makes it even worse watching one of the most savage moments from this story. At some time in the past, this version of the Incredible Hulk turned evil thanks to an event that happened fighting alongside Thor, the Thing, and Hercules. The Hulk turned against his fellow Avengers, Wonder Man, Hawkeye, Mockingbird, and Tigra, who absolutely got it the worst. Tigra against the Hulk is not a fight you would normally expect, and this comic tells you why. As in her attack against the Green Goliath, Hulk simply grabs her and pulls her apart, just like Sentry did with Ares. Hawkeye and Mockingbird literally flee for their lives, while Wonder Man flew into a rage, and he and the Hulk had a slog match that ended up with Wonder Man detonating himself and wiping both himself and the Hulk from existence. 
Number three, disassembled. For me, a big thing that shows just how powerful the Scarlet Witch actually is would have to be the Avengers disassembled event. Wanda and the Wasp were just chilling by the pool when Wasp mentioned Wanda's kids. Now the only problem is that the existence of her children had been wiped from her mind. And when Wasp brought it up, it brought all those memories back and Wanda absolutely lost it. Several things happened next, with none of the Avengers even knowing the cause. For starters, Scott Lang Ant-Man lost his life when a previously deceased Jack of Hearts showed up out of nowhere and just detonated. While the heroes were trying to figure out what just happened, Vision also showed up saying that he was not in control of himself and that he is sorry as he also begins to detonate. And then Jennifer Walters, She-Hulk, began to get uncharacteristically raged and tore Vision in half. Next, we see Tony at the UN conference randomly start to act as though he was incredibly intoxicated even though he hadn't had a single drink. And he verbally accosted the Latvian ambassador and threatened him. Then a whole invasion by the Kree just randomly came out of nowhere resulting in the passing of Hawkeye and then the Kree just randomly left as quickly as they showed up. All of that was actually Wanda Maximoff using her reality warping magic. It almost led to the superhero community deciding to put Wanda into the afterlife and actually led to her creating the House of M reality. Number two, Punisher Max. Punisher Max was an adult comic, and for a guy whose main thing is ushering people to the pearly gates, it kind of makes sense that this setting suits his character best. Removing the Punisher from all the costumes and the superpowers of the regular Marvel Universe and dropping him right into an America facing the early days of the war on terror, it kicked off with the CIA trying to recruit Frank, which sets off a violent political game. This Frank Castle was a veteran of the Cold War, running Black Ops alongside Nick Fury in Vietnam, and he is not someone you want to mess around with. Like, he lights out microchip during the very first storyline just for helping the CIA to even find him in the first place. His enemies here are also much more threatening and kind of scarily realistic compared to anything that Earth-616 has thrown at the Punisher, with a big shout out to Barracuda, another former soldier just as ruthless and skilled as Frank is. Punisher Max shows the very real physical and emotional damage that Frank Castle's crusade would really cause him in real life, obviously with like a tiny suspension of disbelief that comes with the comic book. If you choose to give it a read though, just be warned that it is extremely graphic. And finally, in at number one, it's Craven's Last Hunt. Craven the Hunter's comic book tale seemingly came to an end in one of the most shocking Spider-Man stories ever. Craven's Last Hunt finally sees the Hunter get the drop on Spider-Man. Sticking Spidey in the neck with a dart and then burying Spider-Man six feet under, Craven actually beat his adversary, which only a handful of villains can actually claim to have accomplished. Thinking Peter Parker is down and out, Craven weirdly starts to take on Spider-Man's costume, or at least a copy of the black Spider-Man costume, and he hunts down criminals. In an attempt to prove to himself that he's better than Spider-Man, he defeated Vermin, a villain Spider-Man couldn't defeat without help from Captain America. Unfortunately though, the whole thing still ends in tragedy for Kraven. Spider-Man digs himself out of his grave and renders Kraven's victory moot, but Kraven also had accomplished his main goal by besting Spider-Man. So convincing himself that he has no reason to now live anymore, Kraven chooses to defeat himself permanently. 